Well, I, I want to uh, I want to start by basically concluding uh, the, the subject I was uh, talking about yesterday with uh, uh, one more question that um, may be of some interest, uh, which is an, uh, another question uh, related to the um, Fontaine properties of uh, group or uh, semi-group uh, uh, orbits. Um, Although this this one is of a slightly different nature, and uh, it has to do with uh, Duke Secchi distribution theorem in uh, positive in uh, real quadratic fields. So just as a reminder, um, I will fix an, uh, an um, a positive discriminant, large positive discriminant, which I assume fundamental. Let's say uh, we take d uh, square free, then we can consider. Uh, binary quadratic forms with uh, integer coefficients with that given discriminant. And the collection of these uh, uh, quadratic forms uh, can be partitioned in a finite number of classes forming the class group where uh, the equivalence of, of two of these quadratic forms uh, simply means that one can be transformed uh, into the other one by an SL2Z transformation. So uh, now one can associate uh, to uh, each class a fundamental geodesic. It's, it's only depending on, on the class, uh, which is the closed geodesic in the uh, uh, unit tangent space of the, uh, of the modular surface, which is connecting alpha uh, minus b uh, plus minus square root d to over 2a to its... Uh, its um, it's conjugate. And uh, well, uh, we can take uh, alpha reduced, uh, which will imply that we have a purely periodic continued fraction. So Duke's theorem tells us that properly normalized, if we're looking at the measures, the arc length measures on these geodesics, and we average them over the class group, then as d goes to infinity, this is going to converge weak star to the measure. Uh, the natural measure on the uh, unit tangent space. Uh, this is Duke's theorem. Um, what this is a rather amazing thing, which is an experience I had in uh, in Jerusalem, is that somehow there seems to be some discrepancy between people doing number theory and people doing ergodic theory. So uh, from Duke's theorem, one can in fact derive a statement about uh, individual geodesics, at least about most of them. Because what that statement implies, which is really a statement about the totality of these uh, uh, this, uh, measures associated to the fundamental geodesics, is that in fact, for most fundamental geodesics, we start, we, we're getting icky distribution. So, I mean, it's kind of funny because I, I had this question, so I was asking this question to ergodic theorists. They said, of course, it's trivial. And then you ask it to number theories, and we don't know about such a thing. And then eventually I realized that uh, this is the kind of thing you prove the same way as, as uh, Schneerlmann's theorem on uh, the exceptional sequence, uh, the, uh, which, uh, so if you have, uh, you're looking at the Victor measures associated to the eigenfunctions, and then you have convergence also, except for a thin sequence. This is. Uh, what Schnellman proves, and in fact one can be quite precise, one can even make this thing uh, quantitative uh, in uh, a certain precise way. I will come back to that uh, immediately. Uh, and well, it is basically indeed an, uh, a, a consequence of, of the previous theorem, and because one has this Duke theorem in explicit quantitative form, uh, one can uh, prove some results about uh, what it means, most fundamental geodesics, which are quite precise, and I will come back on that in a moment. But let me recall you that there is a conjecture that, in fact, when the class group is not 
say, the largest possible, if we have a class group which is less than the eta power half minus epsilon, then one, in, one expects that, uh, in fact, all geodesics will, uh, uh, will uh, become equidistributed. Uh, from the, the standard class number formula, uh, what it appears if we believe in this conjecture, and then we are looking, because that is what we are going to do here, at bad events, in other words, fundamental geodesics which are not well uh, distributed, then we have to look at, uh, at quadratic fields with a uh, fundamental solution here, epsilon d, which is quite small. And this will also be apparent in our constructions later on. Regarding this conjecture, there is a theorem of Popper, uh, which tells you that the conjecture is true if the class group, this is Alexandru Popper, uh, if the class group is smaller than some sufficiently small power uh, of, uh, of D, uh, which is a result which is proven using walsh uh, techniques. But in fact, it turns out that Duke's theorem implies uh, a statement which is just a little bit weaker than that already, without going uh, through this, this more sophisticated uh, technology. Uh, whether this uh, is fundamental or not fundamental, uh, one more remark is that even under GRH, uh, one, one can't quite prove that, but we can only get it uh, with, with class groups which are less than the eta power quarter, basically. So that there is some some gap there. So regarding, uh, concerning bad geodesics, there was a problem. I don't know whether this problem was ever written down, but I understood from my quarter that apparently this question was around. Uh, so we're looking at geodesics, uh, fundamental geodesics, which are not well uh, distributed. And so what we can, for instance, ask uh, is whether we have infinitely many of these creatures which does not get into the cusp, stay, say, within uh, a region away from the cusp, in other words, uh, are low-lying. And, um, well, in fact, uh, what is in the literature, and in fact, it's uh, an early paper of uh, Peter Sarnak, which is called uh, Reciprocal Geodesics, is a similar question where, uh, moreover, we're asking the fundamental geodesic to be reciprocal, which means that the underlying uh, quadratic uh, uh, irrational has a continued fraction, which is palindromic. Uh, so actually, it is that paper on reciprocal. Eventually, what happens in that paper is that they start studying Markov triples uh, and things like that. But it's in fact uh, this, uh, problem, as, as it will appear later on, of finding square frees that triggered these developments around the affine sif. So it goes back to that paper. So uh, what, is, what is here is half of what uh, we proved in, say, one paper is, is posted, there is another paper which is uh, in the make. So the, the first paper, the paper which is posted, tells us that the answer is yes. And in fact, we have the following statement. For any epsilon, there is a compact region y uh, in x and a set uh, d of positive fundamental discriminants with the following properties. Well, first of all, uh, if we're taking d in d and we're looking at the, the classes gamma uh, the, the fundamental geodesics gamma, which stay inside that region Y, well, we have plenty of them. In fact, we have as many of them as the, the, the class group at the power 1 minus epsilon. Another statement is that this set D is quite large because the number of elements in D less than T is going to be T a half minus epsilon. So these two statements are best possible. Basically, they are best possible. Uh, the reason is the following. On one hand, uh, what uh, we uh, proved is that uh, no matter what is D, if we are taking the gammas uh, in uh, the fundamental geodesics for which that gamma remains in such a compact region Y, well, the number of these elements is bounded by HD, the size of the class group D minus epsilon, uh, for D going to infinity where the epsilon is going, well, uh, 
basically um, uh, the, the epsilon can be uh, made uh, as small as we want. So uh, what you see are two things. Uh, first of all, if hd is smaller than, than some power sufficiently, uh, is, sorry, if, uh, if uh, hd is going to be, uh, yeah, uh, if hd is going to be smaller than, than some appropriate power of d, then this set is going to be empty, so that comes close to uh, the, the result of Popper. So one way of being not equally distributed, of course, is to stay with it within such, such a compact region. And in fact, the proof of that result, it's exactly what I was referring to before, is that it can be deduced from a quantitative version of, uh, of Duke's theorem. And in fact, what we're using uh, are some uh, explicit results, explicit estimates uh, that appear in a paper of uh, 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 Clausel and, and Ulmo and give really estimates in terms of explicit Sobolev norms, etc., that we then can process to prove that. So uh, that state, I mean, this statement is best possible exactly because of this reason. Uh, is that the, um, what happens is that no matter how we choose uh, the y, we are going, sorry, what I said was nonsense. So no matter how we choose the y, we can find an epsilon uh, so that this property holds. So that statement is best possible. Now, what about that second statement? Well, I should go back to the, um, the Dirichlet class number formula. Uh, if one takes the sum of h d log uh, epsilon d and you sum for d less than x, this thing is well understood. On the other hand, it is much, much harder to understand the sum of h d for d less than x. And there are some, say, the, the Saranac's thesis is, is one of the papers on that. And also there is a paper by, uh, by Hooley about the same time uh, where they study this problem and get uh, results which are uh, unconditional as long as epsilon d is, is quite small, I guess, up to... Uh, uh, up to x or something like that. There has been more, much more recent work now by, by uh, Fouvry, but in any case, this is still for small epsilon d. On the other hand, uh, what, Hulli, what is the conjecture is that if we take the sum of the hds for d less than x, this should be, if I'm not mistaken, conjectured to behave like x log x squared or something like that. And in any case, it means that if we are looking, so Basically, as I said earlier, we should look at uh, discriminants for which the, the class group is of extremal size, like square root of d. Now, if we believe this asymptotic, then the number of such discriminants has to be, uh, has to be smaller than, <coughs> in fact, uh, t at the power half plus epsilon. So this, this came, comes, of, comes close to uh, uh, what we can expect. Now, the way, what, is, what has it to do with um, uh, with uh, orbits. Well, how do we produce these low-lying uh, fundamental geodesics? Well, uh, if we are, so we are, we are looking again, like I did before around the Zaremba problem, at the semi-group generated by this particular uh, matrix, matrices here, where, say, A is bounded by capital A, uh, just to ensure that we are going to have bounded partial quotients and equivalently uh, the uh, corresponding uh, fundamental, the corresponding geodesic is going to be low-lying. So um, uh, the, the alpha, which is represented here, has a discriminant which is trace gamma square minus 4, where gamma, I'm, I'm doing a lot of notational confusion here, but anyway, so gamma is, is that uh, 2 by 2 matrix. And, uh, turns out that in order to get, so the problem is to get fundamental ones. So basically we want to have this d square free. So the problem is to find elements uh, gamma of that form, as many as possible, uh, for which the trace gamma, uh, the square of trace of gamma minus four is square free. There's uh, basically this paper of Sarnak on reciprocal uh, geodesics uh, is uh, led to the same issue about getting square frees in uh, in Markov triples, which is, of course, much, much harder. But here, uh, what uh, we, we can treat this, this problem in a rather simple way, because to get uh, trace gamma 
uh, square minus 4 square 3, what it amounts to is to have trace gamma plus 2 and trace gamma minus 2 square 3. Now, how do we do that? Well, you have a statement here, but what is really going on uh, is that we're getting we're making sure that trace gamma plus 2 and trace gamma minus 2 don't have small prime divisors. And small means some power of n. So really the, the, the statement, this statement follows from another statement is that the number of gammas in Ga which are uh, bounded by n, so in a ball of radius n, well that number is going to be n at the power 2 delta a, from what I discussed before. Uh, now, uh, if we require trace gamma plus 2 and trace gamma minus 2 not to have prime divisors less than n to the epsilon, and the question is how epsilon is going to be, that's going to depend on the level of distribution of the sequence. Uh, well, um, we still will have a lower bound of that form which means that the set of traces is going to be at least n at the power 2 delta a minus 1. In other words, if a is getting large, well, delta a goes to 1, so we're going to have n at the power 1 minus some, uh, something. Right away, what you see is that if the number of traces with the property is bigger than n at the power 1 minus something, so let's call it eta prime, and we, we know, moreover, that, uh, say, trace gamma plus 2, trace gamma minus 2 don't have prime divisors, which are, uh, which are less than n to the epsilon. Well, if this epsilon is going to be larger than whatever this eta prime, we can, of course, conclude that it's square free. So the whole problem there is the following, is that we want to have a level of distribution which does not degenerate when the a goes to infinity, because on one hand I want to be close here to 2, so I have to take a large, but as I told you, one of these drawbacks of the thermodynamical method uh, which is used in sieving is that we don't really know eventually how this resonant free region is going to depend on, uh, on the, the alphabet we're starting from. So just by using that, the problem is that you take a larger to get this 2 delta a close to 1, you may very well lose the level of distribution. So you need to have another device there to take care of that. And that, that's what makes the thing not completely trivial. So like I said, this is, uh, this is half of uh, the story. Uh, there is another theorem, but I didn't put it down because it's not, the paper is not completely written, is that in fact we have a similar theorem for reciprocal geodesics. So again, uh, you have the statement that there is a set D uh, of uh, positive fundamental discriminants, which is the same large and with the property that for D in D, we have at least one um, reciprocal geodesic, uh, which is low lying in the sense that it's contained uh, in, that, uh, in that set uh, y and well what is y basically there is a y we have to we have to take we have to go high, in, uh, high enough and so uh, in some sense this uh, gives an answer to that that question Selnak was uh, was asking at the time so basically this is more or less what I was planning uh, to say uh, the, the, in the previous talk uh, but I could not conclude. Now, I don't have quite time, enough time to, to, to speak about the, the other topic and what I will do is just uh, select a few, uh, a few uh, aspects uh, of what I wanted to discuss in, in, the, in the next talk and I will need your help now. Um, so the, the next subject uh, are uh, number theoretic uh, problems that um, that have to do with uh, total Eigen functions and uh, there is a lot to say there but basically I want to restrict myself uh, to two um, two aspects of this uh, story 
uh, one are moment inequalities uh, of uh, total eigenfunctions, and then the other one uh, is uh, the, the problem of uh, the number uh, Coran's theorem and the, the, the number of uh, nodal domains. So, um, what is uh, interesting about uh, the spectral theory of the, of the flat torus, uh, I mean, perhaps uh, people working in this area, at least most people may not consider it as, as that exciting, but say, uh, say, as a harmonic analyst, um, I like the subject because it's kind of at the interface of, of, of two areas. Say, on one hand, the eigenfunctions are given by explicit trigonometric uh, polynomials, so you can try to do some kind of explicit analysis on that without having to go through this uh, uh, micro-local type of uh, machinery where you basically don't see anything anymore, so this is completely on the table here. Uh, which doesn't mean that the problems are trivial. And then, because we are talking about special, special polynomials, because the frequencies, they correspond to lattice points on spheres, uh, there is, of course, also number theory in that. Uh, there is a third uh, reason why this is perhaps interesting. There is some mysterious correspondence between phenomena that happens for the d-dimensional flat torus, and these phenomena are not stable are not robust in the sense that it's important to keep the torus flat. If we perturb the metric a little bit, we lose them. We lose these features. So on one hand, you have these features for the, the, for the, the flat torus, and on the other hand, you have phenomena which are, of course, not proven, but uh, conjectured, in the, in the, uh, at least in the arithmetic hyperbolic case. And there is some kind of similarity between these phenomena, something which is not that well explained. But in any case, uh, let's not uh, worry about the third aspect. What I want to discuss uh, are certain features, uh, spectral features of the flat torus, and these features are not, uh, are not typical, are atypical, in the sense that if we're looking at other manifolds, we, we don't have, say for instance for the sphere, the uh, situation is quite different. So let us start with the classical moment inequalities. It is well known that the control of the L2 norm of the eigenfunction, say of, so the lambda is always square root of E, right? Uh, the control of the L2 norm is going to give a control on the LP norm. And there are, there are precise bounds on that. And, uh, well, basically you don't have to worry too much about this exponent. So on one hand, you have the behavior at infinity. Uh, you, you just take, uh, uh, P equals infinity is going to give you D minus 1 over 2 for the infinity bound. And then there is an interpolation, but it's not an interpolation with 2, it's a piecewise interpolation, where the uh, critical exponent here is 2D plus 1 over D minus 1. So for a two-dimensional manifold, it's D equals 6. So there is interpolation between 2 and that exponent, and between that exponent and infinity. These bounds are best possible and easily seen to be sharp for the sphere. However, for, this, for the flat torus, one expects better. And these conjectures are also the conjectures that one would make, say, for d-dimensional arithmetic hyperbolic uh, manifolds. So there, the, the breaking point is 2d over d minus 2, and the conjecture is that uh, you have a uniform control of the LP norm by the L2 norm when p is less than 2d <coughs> over d minus 2. In particular, for d equals, for d equals 2, it should be for all p, right? And then, uh, above 2d over d minus 2, one has this bound. And at 2d over d minus 2, one has a divergence which is like lambda to the epsilon. Now, this conjecture is very hard and uh, is basically open, but there has been some progress I like to report on. First of all, there is a result which comes close to such an inequality, although uh, it is still significantly weaker in the sense that we are losing a factor lambda to the epsilon. And that inequality, well, I assume d is at least equal to 3. d, d equals 2 is another story. Uh, I may say a word about that in a moment. But for d at least equal to 3, this result is quite significant. And, uh, well, one can obtain, uh, one get that result for p uh, bounded by 2d plus 1 over d minus 1. Note that this is almost a perfect inequality, a general inequality for explicit, for class of explicit trigonometric polynomials at a fractional p for larger d. 
So it's, uh, there aren't too many examples in, in harmonic analysis where you can prove something in LP without going through an interpolation argument for an even moment. So this is one of the instances of that. And then re regarding the second statement, uh, what uh, one can prove is that the second statement is true for P sufficiently large. And that depends on some earlier work on, on this subject and uh, also on the, on the first statement. So I guess what is the most interesting is the proof of that first statement, which is a consequence of a rather general harmonic analysis theorem, which I obtained with uh, a Cyprinometer a few months ago, and uh, which somehow he calls the L2 decoupling conjecture. Now, what does this thing say? Well, it's one of these... What is nice about the statement is that for once, it's a not quite trivial harmonic analysis statement which is clean in the sense that you get exactly the right exponent and uh, the right bounds or almost the right bounds. So this is a very, very general uh, statement. There is no structure. <laughs> what we are doing is that we are taking a compact smooth hypersurface in RD with a positive, second, with a positive definite second fundamental form. Uh, if we don't have positive, if we have a non-degenerate uh, second fundamental form, there is a version of that, but it requires suitable uh, modification, and in this form it is not correct. Then we are looking at, simply we're taking a small delta, we're taking all functions which live, which Fourier transform, live within a delta neighborhood of this hypersurface S. And then, as people like to do in that field, is to decompose this shell in uh, tangential plates, uh, which are going to be, so the, the thickness of the plate is delta, and the size is, is going to be like square root delta. So you get square root delta in D minus one dimension, and then delta in the remaining dimension. And we can make a corresponding uh, decomposition of F by taking its Fourier transform, restricting the Fourier transform to the plates, and taking inverse Fourier transform. So these Fourier restrictions uh, of, of, the, of the function F uh, is denoted by f sub 2. So then you have an inequality which is, uh, which is rather uh, amazing, is that you can bound the LP norm of f by the, uh, by the, the square function, here the, the L2 norm, of the LP norms of the uh, f of the, whatever, the, the Fourier restrictions f2. Uh, you can do that for p up to a factor delta minus epsilon, where epsilon can be taken arbitrarily small, and that is true uh, for p equals to d plus 1 over d minus 1, and therefore, actually, there is something missing here. p has to be at least equal to 2 uh, below p bigger than or equal to 2, and then what happens, this is an automatic consequence by interpolation, uh, it's not completely trivial, you can interpolate, but you can interpolate. Uh, one will have the obvious bound, uh, which this is what I care about, is p equals 2d plus 1d minus 1, the obvious bound, say, between, uh, between that exponent p and infinity. Now, that exponent is best possible. What one expects, but this is an extremely hard problem, is that in the subcritical regime, you don't need a delta minus epsilon. Anyway, at p equals 2d plus 1 over d minus 1, you will need something. It's, it's not a clean bound. Now, what is remarkable about this inequality is that although it is a general Fourier analytical uh, inequality, uh, its main interests are really Diophantine applications. And uh, in some sense, what you're getting uh, are statements which are arithmetical and for which before either there was only an arithmetical proof known or... Uh, or they are simply new. So this has an amazing, uh, how do you say, has amazing number theoretic uh, uh, implications, which is one of the reasons why somehow in the past I was kind of afraid of believing in such a conjecture, because it really leads to things which are explicit statements uh, about, uh, say, the Alphantine uh, equations, the number of solutions of the Alphantine equations, which I don't know, I didn't know uh, how to prove uh, using standard divisor functions. And in a way, uh, the result, so the first result is just a manifestation of this decoupling theorem. Uh, if you take, for instance, d uh, equals 3, so the exponent here is going to be 4. 
So what is known is that for the, the three-dimensional flat torus, uh, you get a control of the L4 norm uh, by lambda to the epsilon L2 norm. In fact, the lambda to the epsilon shouldn't be there. But anyway, the proof of that uh, is using some kind of arithmetic, some kind of easy divisor considerations. Turns out that these are really facts from analysis, and which raises a, a very interesting question is that uh, one would really like to know uh, how far one can go. Uh, for instance, and this is something I have been working on in the recent months, uh, what you get number theoretic, I will not go into that, it's very reminiscent of Vinogradov's inequality. Uh, Vinogradov's uh, mean value theorem. And somehow what I started wondering is whether Vinogradov's mean value theorem is just a theorem in analysis. So I have a clear analysis conjecture that would imply Vinogradov, which is still open in general. Uh, Woolley has done quite remarkable work on it, but it's only solved for k equals 3, not for larger k. So it could be that, in fact, what is underlying is a very general harmonic analysis principle. In any case, we are getting a certain number of Diophantine consequences of that, uh, which are which are rather surprising. Now, I didn't want to, uh, uh, I don't want to talk too much about the two-dimensional torus. For the two-dimensional torus, of course, things are different because we have very few lattice points. Uh, what it turns out is that the old inequality of Zygmunt Cook about bounding del 4 norm by del 2 norm uh, is still um, the, uh, the best one knows. And in fact, in the world of, of flat tori, it's the only uniform bound on eigenfunctions we have. This is a rather trivial thing, but it's all we have, which is rather shameful, but that's how things are. So uh, earlier, say a couple of years ago, uh, we tried to study uh, this, uh, this problem of, well, it's expected, say, in, in two dimensions, uh, what one expects uh, is that um, basically you will control uniformly all the moments and you would first start looking at the, the sixth moment. So the typical thing is that you would start trying to count solutions uh, of equations p1 plus p2 plus p3 equals p4 plus p5 plus p6, uh, where p are the, the lattice points on, on a given circle. And well, I have done some work with Enrico Bombieri on that. Uh, which was some, well, we did, I mean, we got some things, but altogether was rather disappointing. Uh, so we tried basically everything we could think about uh, with uh, only limited success. So one thing is that uh, what's rather surprising is that the combinatorial approach leads to results we don't know how to get in any other way. So there, is, there are some non-trivial results uh, using uh, incidence geometry on one hand. Uh, then also uh, we looked at the, so if you go brute force analytical approach, you end up with problems on elliptic, about elliptic curves and ranks of elliptic curves. So this is a kind of problem you would say, well, the time is not ripe because you wait until people understand more about the rank of elliptic curves. But if you, if you really, I mean, if you spend some time on it, you really want to prove something, right? So then we kind of eventually convinced ourselves that we got an interesting result. So in any case, um, it's kind of interesting. So what eventually is the state of the situation is that using the incidence geometric approach, we can get a control on the L6 norm, which is not what you'd like. You'd like to put a constant here, but something which is better than what what we know how to get uh, by other means. And uh, this basically is a consequence of the semi trotter theorem. Now, there are stronger incidence uh, conjectures. In particular, there is a so-called Erdős unit distance conjecture, and there has been quite a bit of progress on that, but it's still open. Erdős unit distance conjecture will tell you that if you have n points, then the number of unit distances is bound by n1 plus epsilon. If you assume the Erdős uh, distance conjecture, then you can remove the 112. Here it would have n to the epsilon. Then about having control for all p, well, we can prove it for most e's. Now, for most e's may say not very exciting because for most e's, well, the number of lattice points is going to be only be uh, only going to be the square root of the logarithm of e. So you like to look at situations which are a little bit richer where you have more lattice points. So in particular, like to take for e a smooth number. And uh, well, then we, 
basically what we liked to do from the beginning is trying to do something with elliptic curves and uh, what we managed to do is to prove uh, in, in the realm of smooth numbers uh, an estimate up to n to the epsilon. So here capital N may be confusing. Capital N is the number of lattice points, right? So it's the multiplicity of the space. So we get that kind of inequality, at least for most smooth numbers. And I don't think the result is, is so exciting, but say the technique which is behind it may be of some interest, at least to some of you. And uh, what is the technique? Uh, the technique is the following. Uh, so like I said, you go brute force, you write down, basically you're looking at uh, the equation uh, uh, P1 plus P2 plus P3, uh, equals uh, a given point a b so uh, what you're getting here are three equations in f in um, uh, four unknowns so you can eliminate two of them then you get uh, a curve which is a genus one curve if we assume that it has an, say an integer point we can we can take an origin then we're getting an elliptic curve and then we know from the general theory that we can control uh, the uh, the number of uh, of integral solutions by an exponential of the rank. Now, if we knew that the rank is bounded, of course, we are, we are done. But unfortunately, well, in the, at the time, people were convinced that ranks were not bounded. Uh, what happens here is that we have certain specific families. So now people would tend to believe maybe that within a s fixed families, uh, this is a fixed pencil, uh, the, the rank may be uniformly bounded by, say, even despite whatever recent advances, say, of Bargav and so on, we, we, don't, we don't know that. So we were not willing to assume too much. We still wanted to do something. So what we did is the following. We made a lot of, uh, uh, say, more uh, standard conjectures, say, than start conjecturing things uh, about the rank. And so what we... Uh, assume, well, we don't have to assume modularity anymore, but we assume GRH and we also assume the burst winner on the entire conjecture. That is not so much of a crime. Uh, and in any case, uh, so uh, basically the only halt on, well, I mean, one way, standard way to get the halt on the rank is exactly through this, this conjecture that it will tell you that it is the order of vanishing, what they call the analytic rank of the corresponding uh, uh, Hasse-Vale uh, L function, uh, which is associated to the elliptic curve at the point S equals 1. And that is an object that has been studied, and there is an explicit formula uh, for that, uh, which is uh, due to, uh, to Vail, Vail explicit formula, and it allows you to bound the analytic rank by a certain expression which one can truncate, and then you will see that you have, so the, the main problem is the second term here, so the second term is a certain weighted sum, the, the capital X is a parameter here, uh, so what you get here is a weighted sum uh, of quantities which I call A sub P E and this A sub P E are basically certain character sums. Now the, the problem with this thing is the following, uh, if you just estimate these character sums you're getting something like square root of P. So if you put here your square root of P you're going to have something here which is going to be of size well, a bound, you get the square root of whatever bound on P, the bound on P being exponential in X, and that doesn't give you anything. So what has to be exploited here is a double cancellation. So we need to exploit the cancellation from the summation in X and also from the summation in P. And there's nobody who knows how to do that presently. So since we can't do that, uh, we have to do an average. And so people have done that, starting from the work of, of Goldfeld, uh, and then his brown considers exponential moments as needed if you want to control uh, the, the number of lattice points because you have the exponent of the rank. But all these arguments are for nice families. Uh, now, basically, I made a statement for almost, smooth, for almost all smooth numbers, so what you're getting Eventually, when you look at the underlying uh, elliptic curves, 
uh, what you're getting is a family which is not arithmetic at all. This is a combinatorial family. It's a little bit like what I was talking the, before, is that you have objects which are purely combinatorial. But what is nice is that when you try to use this explicit formula, you only care about the behavior mod p for each individual p. So you do a reduction of this family mod p. So most of the work we had to do was to show that this combinatorial family, when you reduce it mod p, in fact behaves like, like a nice family. Uh, and that uh, then basically uh, once you have a nice family uh, you can start using uh, you can start using exponential sums exponential uh, well i mean character sum estimates uh, over finite uh, fields uh, basically uh, character sums estimates on that uh, when uh, you vary uh, rs in a certain say, nice family uh, uh, of um, um, elliptic curves uh, over Fp. And uh, basically, uh, you always have the double cancellation as long as the J invariant is non-constant. I mean, this is, a, this is a standard thing. So there we could make something work. So I think this idea of uh, I mean, this observation that, uh, in fact, you only care about behavior for individual P is kind of interesting that it may apply also uh, in other uh, situations. At least this is something new, something that, was, that, that had not been done before. Now, the, the second thing I want to discuss uh, is another problem um, which may be of interest to some of you, which is what happens with Curran's nodal domain uh, theorem uh, in the case, say, of the two-dimensional flat torus. So the, the general theorem of Courant tells you, this is always true, uh, that the nth eigenstate has at most n nodal domains. But then for, pla for planar uh, domains, say for planar mem membranes, this applies to the torus also, there's a better result by Pleyel, uh, which is a consequence of the Faber-Kran inequality, which gets you that number 0 0.691, etc. So try to remember that number. Uh, and well, this is not uh, best possible. In fact, the conjectured bound would be 2 over pi from above. Recently, there has been some very small improvements on that. Uh, I have some results, and then there are some related results by Steinerberger, where we go down a little bit. It's basically a macroscopic uh, improvement. But say, maybe the argument is, is the most interesting part because what is exploited here, what is exploited there, are certain stabilities of the uh, so-called Faber-Kran inequality, which is underlying that. And then also uh, some old result about packing densities of disks. And I think maybe this is the first application of that result. This is a result that was gotten like 40 years ago. A result of blind, there are several papers, which tells you that if you pack disks of a radius between two bounds, say A and B, with a ratio, say, uh, B over A, which is sufficiently controlled, then the density can't be more than the density that you get for the ordinary packing. So there, there is, I mean, there is such a result. I don't know why people cared about that at the time, but this has an application there. So uh, these are upper bounds. Lower bounds, you can't say anything intelligent. There is a result of there is a, there are constructions by I think goes back to uh, to Hans Lewy uh, in the old days who showed that you can have for arbitrary large uh, eigenvalue you can also make constructions on the torus situations where only two nodal domains. So now what I want to talk about is uh, um, a uh, subject that has been rather popular over the recent years, which is the Bogomolny-Schmidt conjecture. So Bogomolny-Schmidt uh, tells you that the asymptotic distribution of nodal domains of chaotic manifolds is universal and is described by percolation theory. Now, this is, is nothing proven there, but note that the expectation for the number of nodal domains is 10 times as smaller than what you get from Pleyel. So, kind of interesting to try to understand that. Now, um, you see, what happens is that, okay, so this is chaotic manifolds. We are looking on flat torus. They are not chaotic, but there is this, uh, this Berry principle that the expectation, one expects that, say, whatever happens for, um, for uh, eigenfunctions 
uh, in, uh, in the chaotic case, say when you have an, uh, hyperbolic manifolds, is going to be reflected by the generic behavior of eigenfunctions on a completely integral manifold, and so particularly on, on a flat torus. So these are many beliefs, and one should separate the different issues here. So the first issue is whether there is really something like an, uh, a limiting behavior for, uh, for, uh, for random eigenfunctions. For instance, if you take uh, uh, the sphere, uh, you can take random spherical harmonics, you can count their nodal domains. Is there really a limit distribution uh, when the eigenvalue goes to infinity? So this is proven by Nazarov and Sodin in, in a very nice paper with some equally nice follow-up in more recent, uh, I think, I don't know if the paper exists already or not. Let's see some, some uh, joint work of uh, uh, Peter Sarnak and uh, Igor uh, Wigman that have further developed these techniques. Uh, in any case, what happens with this technique is that you really prove that there is some convergence to a limit distribution, but it doesn't tell you anything about what is really the limit distribution. So at this point, what is rigorous, rigorously known is that this, uh, this average expected number is going to be bounded, say, by 0.22, uh, two, etc., which is significantly smaller than what you get from Playel, but still, um, well, it's still about four times as big as what it should be. On the other hand, uh, there has been numerical studies by various people, and these numerical studies, they kind of predict the number, but not quite, so that the tendency now is to believe that uh, indeed somewhere the, this expectation is around uh, what is prescribed by a percolation model, but uh, it's not exactly that. And in fact, there are no real serious, uh, I mean, there are flaws in the justification why this number should be, should correspond uh, to, some, uh, to some percolation principle because the, the features are really different there. Now, what I want to talk about, it's something slightly different. Basically, uh, one like to say that um, the um, behavior in chaotic, uh, for, for chaotic, uh, in case of chaotic dynamics, say if you have a uh, hyperbolic uh, surface, is going to be similar. So there we are running to the problem, how can you deterministically impl implement this random wave model? And well, that, that's, not, that's not so easy. Um, there are some potential developments there. Uh, now, in, so in some sense, you could try to justify that uh, by extending the, the general belief, say, that in this hyperbolic world, eigenfunctions tend to have a Gaussian behavior. So we, can, we could build on that and make stronger assumptions that somehow uh, would possibly justify uh, the behavior like a random wave model. But what it turns out, so there are some results which, I mean, there is a result in this direction which is non-trivial. Uh, which is the conditional result. Uh, I'm actually not sure, maybe not conditional. But in any case, uh, certainly not directly relevant to Bogomol nor Schmidt, but it tells you something on trivial, is that at least you don't have this Lewy phenomenon. The number of nodal domains uh, is going to infinity, and in fact, the results are more precise, uh, and um, they are, they are basically, uh, I think maybe the most interesting part are the techniques which are involved. It's, it's, it's a non-trivial uh, non statement that I wouldn't say it's directly related to the, the Bogomol-Schmidt uh, problem. Well, what it turns out is that you can prove a deterministic result for the flat torus. And uh, there are two statements here, which are both are number theoretic. Uh, the first statement is that uh, for E in a set of full density, if you're taking eigenfunctions any way you want, I'm not talking about uh, random eigenfunctions, what I'm doing is taking eigenfunctions, say, with coefficients that you choose to be flat. So let's take, we take the x is all the same to be equal to 1. So this is a deterministic example. Well, what happens is that uh, you will have in the limit for the number of nodal domains the same asymptotic as in the random wave model. If you want a deterministic result, well, you have that same statement, uh, 
in certain, under certain assumptions on E, in particular if E runs in a sequence of energies uh, for which the number of prime factors remains bounded, you will have that same phenomenon also. So we're trying to mimic Gaussian distributions and uh, well basically there are two number theoretic uh, things which go into that. Uh, the first is uh, a phenomenon of equidistribution of lattice points on circles. Uh, so looking at uh, the lattice points on a circle of radius square root of E and you're looking at the, then the angular distribution of these lattice points and you have an estimate on the discrepancy uh, which is non-trivial, uh, it gets you something and it basically has to do with the distribution of uh, Gaussian primes in, uh, in sectors. Now another input, uh, basically you know uh, if you want to um, to prove something about Gaussian behaviors, uh, you will have to estimate moments sooner or later. So what is important is to control additive relations in the frequencies. Well, now we, are, we are well beyond LP, LP bounds, we really want to have the right behavior. So what turns out this is relevant uh, in, the, uh, in the second statement, in the deterministic statement, is that in fact much more should be true Let's say as a consequence, as a consequence of the of the subspace theorem, what one has are uniform bounds on additive relations in groups of bounded rank. So what happens is that uh, really, uh, if we control the number of prime factors, then we have a group. Say we have r prime factors, we have a group of rank r, and then we can use uh, the the work of Evers, uh, Schlickewey, and Schmidt, uh, which will tell you that if we say the number of solutions of the unit of a unit equation, say one equals something, uh, solutions which are not degenerate is bounded explicitly in terms of, of, the, of L and uh, the rank of the group in, in a very explicit way and in fact one even expects to have better bounds that would give even, even better results without having to assume uh, almost anything on the number of prime factors, in fact nothing at all. But so far one doesn't have this uniformity. In particular we'd like to know that the number of solutions grows say sub-exponentially sub in the rank, but this is not known, to say the bounds are exponential in the rank. Now anyway I don't have a unit equation here so you, you would have to reduce it to, to unit equation and in this form so you will have an extra factor here which is this n which is the number of lattice points. So this is an extremely strong statement because it basically tells you that you don't have non-degenerate de, non relations. And somehow you can put these things together and prove with some work, uh, mostly soft I would say, uh, that uh, you will have uh, a distribution. I mean it requires an idea of course that you can prove, you can do a deterministic implementation of this random wave model. Now the advantage of this is that uh, unlike in uh, these experiments which were done by these various people, uh, if we want to check this random wave model, now we have, uh, we have some construction that does not require you to generate random coefficients. It was never really clear to me how they generate random coefficients anyway. But let's say here at least we don't have to do that. We can just take all the coefficients to be one. So uh, since I don't know how to operate an, uh, a computer basically, I had to rely on some help and uh, what, well this is not very, uh, what uh, I asked, uh, this is a student of Alex Gambart, uh, what is his name, uh, Michael McGee, uh, he did some, some plots and well uh, these are plots for various E square free or, or not square free. Uh, these plots they don't tell you much. So this is uh, something that is maybe better visible, uh, uh, tells you more which is about the level set. So you're talking about the black area I think uh, where uh, f is going to be less than one-fifth of its infinity and then the white where it is more. Anyway this is not, uh, you see then for the, in, so I forgot what are the numbers here, I think the uh, the the first one is um, square free, the second one is not a square free, somehow there is a different behavior. But what is quite interesting to me, it's something else. Uh, you can do a count of these nodal domains and what really turns out is that basically uh, the, 
the number of nodal domains is pretty much in the ball game of the Bogomol Schmidt, like it would be. Say of uh, well, I mean you have you have situations where it uh, it corresponds uh, quite uh, quite well. So here, for instance, you have zero zero six, which is exactly uh, the the constant we want. In any case, the numbers we're getting here are very well below the deterministic thing. Uh, we are getting from uh, from Playel or the conjecture trait bound. They are pretty much uh, in the, the game of Bogomol Mishnit. And in fact, uh, among these experiments, there are situations where these lattice points are not so well equidistributed. So what they should do uh, is ask him at some point to to make maybe also to 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 put the discrepancies of the distribution and probably one. Uh, one will see that these numbers are even more in correspondence when these discrepancies are getting quite uh, quite small. I think maybe I should stop here uh, that you you got fed up. I can go on more, but I guess I probably will, will stop here. Okay. Are there any questions or comments? Yes. So some of the predictions you talked about were for a general uh, um, general m squared plus m squared, and now you're limiting to. Uh, and talk a little louder. So in this uh, in this numerical computation, yes. you're limiting to having the, the energy uh, with low um, with a only a limited number of point factors. No, no, we just look at everything. Uh, of course because of the nature of, these are relatively small numbers, we don't have too many prime factors. For most of them, the number of prime factors is, is going to be relatively low. Now, I wouldn't worry about that, because, say, if you assume something which is a little bit better than what one knows to prove in terms of dependence on the rank of the group, it wouldn't be an issue anyway. So this is not, I mean, this is not really so much of, a, of an issue. Uh, the, the question was more, well, you, prove, you prove something theoretical, but then you may start asking, when does this stuff really kick in? And apparently it already kicks in at a very low level, which is kind of, this is what, what I wanted to check, is how far one has to go to see something. that. Uh, and presumably these things are, I, I would say, more reliable than what you do with, with random coefficients, because, okay, if you're looking at uh, spherical harmonics, random coefficients with uh, God knows... Uh, uh, 100 uh, or something frequencies, I don't see how you generate 100 random coefficients. This is just, so you need to use them. So the random type thing, so I mean, what does it really mean? Yes? So back in uh, the section of your talk where you're uh, giving inequalities for LP norms of the, the yeah. eigenfunctions of the flat tori, right. um, so can you give me an idea of why there should be some transition between small p and large p in these inequalities, like why? Oh yeah, it's just from the number of lattice points. Okay. You just do the trivial bound right. and then you see. Basically whatever comes out, it's what you get from checking what happens on zero. So you just look at the contribution of the major arc around zero and then you um, you decide this is it. So maybe this is not it, but still the chance that this is it is, is quite high. At least it's confirmed for large P. Okay. Yes? Uh, instead of flat tori, if we take uh, a negatively curved manifold, can you give me an idea of what should be the bounds of LP norms? Say again? Instead of flat tori, if we take some negatively curved manifold, Negatively curved manifold. Yeah, uh, not just uh, arithmetic hyperbolic manifold. Any negatively curved manifold. Yeah, I don't know. The, I don't know of any experiments. All they are all in the arithmetic case. So, what's your question? Is what? Can we have some uh, LP bound like uh, you gave uh, in? Uh, ah, right, right. Uh, yeah, well, this is a, a story by itself. You know, um, of course, there is nothing that precise. Uh, so. A very modest thing would be to, so the first thing you like to show is that there is some better infinity bound than the trivial bound. Okay? So even that is not well understood. So one may hope to have a power gain there. And in the in a non-arithmetic case, this is not known. So what is known is a gain of a logarithm or something like that, but not, not a power gain. 
question which is harder is to try to get something non-trivial for the L6 norm. This has been recently achieved uh, by uh, in some, some work of, uh, of Sock and, and Zeldich, uh, which are based on geodesic restrictions of Hagen functions. So it's, it's a way to connect uh, LP norms on the whole manifold and L2 norms of geodesic restrictions. So there are some developments there that eventually led to a say non-trivial theorem. But it's not that they are not proven. Basically, almost nothing is proven, not even a power gain. Only in the arithmetic case. And in the arithmetic case, uh, well, I mean, uh, some of these things are, uh, of course, are, are conjectural, uh, but the powers are not necessarily the, the right powers also. This is not me. OK. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes, sorry. Sure. So uh, you're using this, the subspace theorem for your, yeah. your preview results. So, so are some of the constants in your results ineffective then? Um, well, what I'm using is the statement. I'm using the statement in Yano's paper, uh, which uh, is, is more than, than, than I really need, uh, which is based on an earlier paper by these guys, which uh, appeared in, uh, in Kreles' journal, uh, which is the, the absolute, uh, absolute subspace theorem. So I don't know about ineffectiveness of certain constants. What matters for me is that there is an explicit, not only effective, but explicit dependence on the rank. And that, that is very, very precise. And you get a dependence on the length of the relation, uh, which is not too much of, a, of an issue. What is more of an issue here is it depends on the rank. So these dependence on the rank are exponential in the rank. And one, in fact, believes that they are sub-exponential. Now, there may be other things ineffective there, but they do not affect the bounds in terms of dependences on the rank and L. So, so I think in the, sh in the Schmitz space theorem in this variance also, the, the number of exceptional things is always effectively bounded, but it's the height, okay. which is always the issue. So if you only need to know how many exceptions, I mean, how many relations there are, it's always effective. If you want to know the size of the coefficients in possible relations, then it's not effective. So the number is, is, is number if, yeah, effective. right. Yeah, that's what I remember. No, may I think there you, what is enough is to have a much more modest theorem that you probably don't have to go uh, use this, uh, this absolute subspace theorem to deal with that because after all we're talking about arithmetic, about integers in some sense. What's remarkable about this theorem is it's a theorem about uh, real numbers. There's no algebraic number there. So this is a theorem about groups, uh, f uh, finite, say, uh, groups of, of, uh, of, say, some bounded rank so in, in the complex numbers, so there is absolutely no assumption about uh, algebraicity, and still the proofs are based on algebraicity, that one may imagine that there is a proof possible that doesn't go through these machines. So you distinguish large height, small height, etc. So that, that's a, a whole process which, well, there is a trivial reduction that you can assume that these, these guys, you can find a model, say, I guess this is kind of a logic, uh, general principle is that you can always rephrase, the problem is equivalent with the problem in alge in, for algebraic numbers without really specifying what is the height of the number and then one has to start distinguishing. So you would imagine there has to be a proof that does not use that, uh, but this is not. Uh, I don't know the details of the argument. I should have told you that right away. This, I had, this is why I had to turn around the question without getting to the point. I never read that and I refused to. Uh, I mean, <laughs> everybody has his. Uh, Any other question? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, your paper with Von Bieri, so yeah. when you reduce to algebraic exponential sum, so the basic variables, uh, they are of, so the initial variables, so the, the one coming from the, the smooth. Uh, yeah, number. right. So in, uh, well, I have should you have. The Paul Gavin of Rada French, or. Uh, uh, what do you mean by that? I mean, uh, what? What is the level of difficulty of evaluating the, the algebraic exponential sums? Of well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you right away. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's that's the what we have. Okay. So first of all, it turns out that all these guys they sit in the same in in, in, in a one parameter family. Uh, so you, write, you can write a Weierstrass equation, and then there is a parameter lambda there, and this lambda is 
So it's one parameter which is expressed in terms of AB, remember P1 plus P2 plus P3 equals AB and E. So we have a distribution there which is a rather wild distribution, but it turns out that when you look at mod P, somehow you can prove uh, that this distribution mod P becomes basically the uniform distribution on FP. That is, that is what is going on. And then once you have that, then the thing is completely standard because you can, I mean, there is a paper by Nick Katz in the bulletin that studies uh, that kind of question. So we need double cancellation, right? So we have, uh, so that's the next one. So we have this exponential sum here uh, in X. Uh, we can't exploit the, the cancellation by summing in P, but we can exploit the cancellation uh, when RS are arranging in some, in some manifold in FP, provided we have a non-constant gene variant. Okay. This is all you need, non-constant gene variant. It gets you double. You need a double cancellation. And then you're, I, I don't know if that answers to some yeah, extent. Yeah, but, but so, because it's so, so it means yeah. the variable are relatively long. So, what the, uh, so the one, the... The initial variable is horrendous, tremendous. It only becomes good when you reduce mod p. Okay. So, so okay. 40, 30 pages are just to show that this, this distribution is good mod p, which okay. is not a trivial thing. Okay. And of course, it's not perfect. Right? Nothing is perfect, but things are good enough that you can implement the uniform distribution of things. And, but then, at the moment, you do not exploit potential p averaging, so to get further cancellation. And none of these guys does that. Okay. I mean, if you go back to, uh, to this, these other papers, they don't exploit the p average. Uh, they, at least, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, what they exploit is the average of the family. Uh, yes, so, but, so then when you, it may, in some cases it may be possible to, to use the fact that uh, yeah, well, uh, what you get is some, some kind of horizontal subtle yeah, tate. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, but do we, do we know a horizontal subtle tate for such things? Uh, it, it depends of what uh, elliptic surface you have, then it could be related oh, with that, the that would be uh, Okay, in some cases it could be something kind of modular and then you might use things around tate conjecture. So. So there we would fix the elliptic curve and start trying to make an estimate of the analytic rank for a given elliptic curve by using a double cancellation that involves also the modulus. Well, I mean, we didn't know about such results, but maybe, maybe you know that there are such things. So in principle, there may be such things. What do you expect? I don't know. It's a question. So the, the yeah. I, I don't know because I don't know precisely the shape of the, yeah. the surface, but uh, okay. Well, we were checking with, uh, with Katz and he didn't seem to, uh, to for him, he didn't seem to. Uh, so what you like is some kind of horizontal set of uh, well, I mean, which is, which is not so easy in, in, in that case. But as far as I know, this other people, Goldfeld, Brummer, he's Brown, they use as a second average, averaging parameter, they use the family. And then, uh, well, that's much easier than using the modulus, right? You fix the modulus. And, Thank you again.